right. Are you ready to study the Word for a few moments tonight? If you have your Bible tonight, I want you to open up to James chapter 1. James, the first chapter. And we've been talking about dealing with adversity. And uh, this is my fifth part in this series. And tonight we'll conclude the message tonight. And we also will have uh, an incredible testimony from Lara Stam tonight, sharing how she dealt with an incredible adversity in her life and her family. And uh, we're going to talk about that in just a few moments. But I just want to sort of uh, lay a little foundation and build upon what I've been talking about. It's sort of like bring this to a close. You really can't close a message like this because there's always going to be adversity in your life. And uh, you don't have to pray for it. You don't have to believe for it. Jesus said in John 16, 33, he said, In this world you shall have tribulation. And I'm glad he didn't stop there, but he did say something that is important for us to note. He said, in this world, you'll have tribulation. So don't get upset. Don't get worried when tribulation shows up. It's just part of life. And we all have to deal with things, and we don't like to deal with situations that arise that are uncomfortable or, uh, you know, we want everything in our life to go perfect, don't we? We have this little vision of life because Hollywood has told us we can have life a certain way and we're going to live problem free for you know 120 years and never deal with an issue and then Jesus is going to come back we're not going to die Jesus is going to come back and we're going to meet him in the air and we're going to so ever be with the Lord forever and ever so we have this little fairy tale vision in our minds but the Christian life is marked by tribulation and adversity but Jesus said be of good cheer and the reason why we can be of good cheer is because he overcame the world. And if he overcame the world, that means that I have the power, the ability, the grace of God upon my life to overcome. And you're going to find something out that if you begin to overcome challenges and obstacles in life, you're going to find out that you're not going to become weaker, but you're going to become stronger. Anybody know what I'm talking about? The more adversity that I face, we think that it's going to deplete us or it's going to stretch us or it's going to push us off the mark. But really, the adversity that you and I face makes us stronger because the more that I overcome, the more I am empowered on the next level to be able to resist the next thing that I'm going to have to deal with. So we're learning how to deal with adversity, and no one is immune to it. Matter of fact, my text was in the beginning from Proverbs 24.10, that if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. So in other words, my strength can be small, and I can still not faint. And the reason why, even when my strength is, uh, my, my strength is small, I could still overcome is because we found out that God's grace is available to, uh, towards us, and his strength is made perfect, not in my strength. His strength is not made perfect when I'm on top of the mountain. His strength is made perfect in my weakness. So when I can begin to tap into the grace or the power of God, when I'm weak, the Bible says, let the weak say I'm strong. It doesn't say let the weak say they feel strong because you may not feel strong tonight. But it's not based on how you feel. It's based on what God has invested on the inside of you. So even when you feel weak, you could say, you know what, I'm strong. Well, you don't look strong. You look like you're going through a difficult time. Yeah, but I'm strong, not because I'm strong in myself. I'm strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Oh, come on, help me somebody. So we know our strength is not about our ability, but God's grace. And we talked about it in the Apostle Paul's life that he sought the Lord three times for the attacks and all the adversity that he had coming against him. And the Lord said, my grace is sufficient for you. Do you know that God's grace is more than enough that you need? That whatever you're facing in life tonight, God's grace can make up the hedge and make up the difference in your life to cause you to overcome. So I want to leave you tonight with you focusing on being cheerful in the midst of the struggle. That's why I talked about being a cheerful giver tonight in our offering. Because sometimes when you're in a financial crunch, it sometimes doesn't feel good to be cheerful when you're giving when things aren't going well financially. But we have to find out that all of us walk through financial difficulties, at least most of us have, at one time or another. But if Jesus said we can do it, then we can do it. And I want you to look here in James chapter 1, as I just take a few minutes and just exhort you uh, regarding this. In, in the book of James chapter 1, 
James said uh, here in verse number two, he said, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials. Now, I don't know about you, but early on in my Christianity, when I fell into a various trial, I was the farthest thing from counting it all joy. Matter of fact, I was saying, woe is me, and why is this happening to, to John? Why do I have to go through this? And then I discovered something, that I can count it all joy because what the enemy means for evil, God is going to use to turn it around, not only for the good in the situation, but also in the good in my life. So we have the ability not only to deal with adversity, but actually to be excited and actually to throw a party and realize that something is going to work on our behalf in the midst of the trial that is going to bring me to a higher level in my relationship with God, but also I'm going to rise to a higher level of authority in the earth because I'm going to have something working for me that was not working apart from the trial. So I count it all joy. I get excited about, not for the trial, we're not, you know, uh, sadistic, where we say, man, bring on the trial so I can count it all, all joy. You know, I want to experience more pain and more opposition. No, we're not praying that. We're not praying for trials. But when they come, we can count it all joy. Why? Because we know something. See, until you know something, you really can't deal with adversity correctly. Until you know what I'm about to show you in the Word of God, it, it'll change your life, what I'm going to show you in just a few minutes. But what you need to understand is you have to know it. You can't just know it because someone in the church knows it or because the pastor knows it or because someone experienced it. You've got to experience it yourself. You have to know that the testing of your faith produces patience. So to really deal with adversity... You need to come to the place where you start laughing at the adversity and understanding that it's going to produce something on the inside of me that is going to cause me to rise greater and reach farther and experience more than I've ever experienced more in the kingdom of God. So we understand that faith and patience really is something that are the Siamese twins that go together that enables you to count it all joy. Why can I count it all joy when I'm going through a, an incredible trial? Because I'm not looking at the trial. I'm not looking at what's coming against me. I'm not looking at the opposition that I'm facing. I'm not looking at the trouble that I'm challenged with tonight. I'm looking at the God who is greater than any problem that I will ever experience in my life. And he that is for you will not be against you. Job said this in Job 5.22, and I don't have time to talk about his life. But Job went through some incredible losses. Lost his kids, lost his livestock, lost his business, lost his house, lost just about everything. And it says in Job 5.22, you shall laugh at destruction and famine, and you shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. In other words, sometimes when things are going wrong in the natural, I start to just belly laugh. And I'm telling you, I start to laugh because I know that God is going to bring me through that situation. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 4, while we look not at the things that are seen, but we look at the things that are unseen, because the things that are seen are temporary, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So what are you looking at? What are you focused on? Your testing season is your producing season. See, I'm in a testing season right now, and I'm excited because I know it's going to produce something in my life. It's going to produce something in this church. I'm not getting worried. I'm not getting anxious, anxious. I'm not losing sleep at night. I'm not tossing and turning. Matter of fact, I'm sleeping better now than I ever have in my entire life. And the reason is because I know my testing season is my producing season. And if you know that the test that you're going through is just to give you a testimony, like we're going to hear tonight, the testing will pass, but the testimony will be eternal that you can share with people every single day that that can liberate them from the clutches of the enemy. So it's going to produce patience inside of me, but he says, but it's the trying of my faith that produces patience. It's the testing of my faith that produces patience. And then he says, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. The Bible says in Hebrews 6, 12, that you be not slothful or lazy, but followers of them who through faith 
and patience. Say faith and patience. Say it again. Say faith and patience. In other words, you need both. Because you can be faith and impatient and you'll miss God. So it's faith and patience. Is patience just sitting idly by, waiting for something to happen for 40 or 50 years? No, patience is in a state of expectation. In other words, my faith is working even though I don't see the promise manifest in the natural yet. Even though I don't see the promise manifest in the natural yet doesn't mean that it's not going to come to pass. I just have to be patient. And in my patience, the Bible says we need to possess our own souls because we have to stay in faith in those moments where we are being tested because the trying of my faith is going to produce a greater patience in my life. So what happens is, church, if you can get this, the longer that you walk with God and the more that you're tried for your faith, the more that you're going to be patient in every single aspect of testing that you face in your life. So when you're going through something now, you don't get all frazzled. You don't get worried. You don't get up too high when things are going well, and you don't get down in the dumps when things are going bad. You just stay on an even keel. Why? Because I know that the trying of my faith is going to enable me to continue to believe God and not be moved by what I see, not be moved by what I hear, not be moved by what I feel. I'm only moved by the word and the promise and the covenants of God in my life. So it doesn't matter that I don't see it show up today on Thursday. It's going to show up maybe Friday or Saturday or Sunday or Monday, but eventually it's going to show up so I can be patient. And if we can raise up believers like that, that won't be up and down, in and out, wishy-washy all the time, but that they're steadfast in the things of God, and they're not moved by what comes against them, they'll, they'll have a greater outlook, and you'll be cheerful in the process, knowing that your God is going to come through for you on every wave. Amen. So Abraham, after he patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Now, I want you to turn back to Habakkuk chapter 3. That's going to be where all your pages are stuck together. Habakkuk. That's why they give you an index if you can't find it in the front. It's okay. You're not there reading it every single day. But it's a very short three chapters in the Bible, and I would encourage you to take the time to read it because Habakkuk goes from a burden to a prayer to faith to a song by the end of the whole thing. And see, the burden that he saw, God told him to write a vision down. He saw the burden, he had the problem, and he didn't focus on the problem. God wanted him to write the vision so that he could see the vision, so that people could see the vision, that they that read it would begin to run with that vision. In other words, whenever you face a problem, God has an answer. See, whenever we have a problem, we can open up to an answer. And see, if you focus on the answer, the problem may not change today or tomorrow, but you will change how you deal with the problem and how you face the challenges of life. So when I look at the problem through the eyes of God's word, that's how I'm an overcomer. Because this is the victory that overcomes the world, the Bible says, even my faith. So I've got to operate in the faith of God in order to overcome. And by the time you get to the end of this chapter, uh, of chapter 3, in Habakkuk chapter 3, he begins to say something that I want you to catch tonight, because sometimes, and you might be here tonight, or you may be watching by live stream, and maybe you're going through an incredible challenge. Maybe you've got a report from a doctor that's not good. Maybe you've lost your job. Maybe there's a situation in your marriage where a spouse has walked out. Or maybe there's something tragic that just happened, a loss of a loved one. And sometimes you don't always see the fruit on the onset. And God wants us to be able to look beyond the pain in order to see that he's going to come through eventually. In other words, it may not be today, but that's okay. God is still in the here and now. And he says here in verse number 17, he said, Though the fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit beyond the vines. Now, when he's sharing this, he's getting a revelation of something. And this is really what I want to deposit into your spirit and into your soul tonight, is that he's getting a revelation of something that life is more than me just experiencing good things in life. Life is more than just experiencing manifestations or promises. See, we can't live our lives just for the manifestation. 
We can't live our lives just for believing for something to come to pass because a lot of us are living that way, and when things come to pass, we're happy, and when things don't come to pass, we're disappointed. See, faith is not you believing for certain things, and then they come to pass to bring you joy. Your joy is based upon your relationship with God. Your strength is based upon your covenant relationship with God. So we have to take all of the periphery out, out of the way and off the table tonight to be able to say, will I really be happy? Will I really be strong in God? Will I really be joyful? And will I be cheerful even if I'm going through difficult seasons for the rest of my life? Hello? See, when I read last week about the Apostle Paul and all the things that he had going on in his life, the stonings shipwrecked, beaten with rods, left for dead, in famine, in hunger. It never stopped him or changed his demeanor of how he felt towards God or the call of God on his life. Most of us would have thrown in the towel a long time ago, but Paul had a revelation of something, and Habakkuk has got a revelation of something that he didn't have when he first started in his journey with God, and that was simply this. If I don't see anything on the vine, and if I don't see any fruit, guess what? I'm not going to get deterred. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm not going to give up on my God. He said, though the labor of the olive may fail and the fields yield no food. Doesn't say some food. You know, some of us miss a meal and we're cranky and miserable. He says, what if it yields no food? What if, it, what if there's no provision there? In other words, he's talking about relating to things in the natural that we need in order to survive in this life. And see, that's why when Jesus began to te teach, isn't the life more than food and the body more than raiment? In other words, our focus on what we major on in America is so far from the kingdom because we focus on just taking care of this physical body, and yet most people don't take care of their soul and their spirit, which is more important than their physical body. Because the physical body isn't going to be here forever, but the soul and spirit will live on forever. So whatever you feed is what's going to grow. Oh, you didn't like that right there. Whatever you've been feeding every single day is what's going to grow in your life. And if you're not happy today, if you're a little bit miserable because you're in some type of testing or some type of tribulation, honey, get off your soapbox because we're all in the same boat. We may face different tribulations or different trials, but we all face them all the time. And the difference between someone who's happy in the midst of them, who can throw a party and count it all joy, is that person that is feeding his soul and his spirit every single day more than this physical body that's why jesus could go 40 days and 40 nights without a lick of food and be able to say man does not live by bread alone but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of god so he's looking at all this and he says, though the flock may be cut off from the fold and there be no herd in the stalls he's talking about nothing 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 if everything was stripped away from you tonight, I wonder how happy the church would be. See, I believe what we're walking through is a little bit of a testing in this sense that we're walking out of an incredible facility, right? Into something that is a small little box that, you know, is going to make do. But God is saying, I believe, and what he's trying to teach me as well as all of us, is that are you dependent on buildings and comfort, or are you dependent upon me? In other words, if the building's not there tomorrow, can you still be the church? If you don't have all the bells and whistles and gadgets, can you still be the church? If you don't have what the world calls what a church should have, can you still impact people out in that culture that are wounded, that are broken, that are hurting? Can you be able to minister to them even though you're going through an adversity yourself? Even though you're dealing with adversity, can you put your adversity aside for a minute to minister to someone else's plight? He said, if there's nothing there, verse 18, key verse, he said, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. Oh, my God, I'm getting excited. Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. In other words, all these things that I needed before God, that was a burden to me, that I was looking to, that I thought would satisfy me, 
now I understand that even when it's all taken away, can I rejoice in the Lord? I will joy in the God of my salvation. I read something so powerful this week. I don't know if Jim Carrey, the great actor, had an encounter with God or not, but he made, made a statement that absolutely uh, was incredible. And he said this. He said, I wish that everybody in the world could experience all the fame and all the money that I've made and all the perks that I've experienced in life. He said, I wish everybody could experience it so they would know that after all that, you're still not satisfied. You're still empty. In other words, we think that those things are going to bring us joy. And the man is saying right here, he's saying, you know what? You might be going through a difficult season. You might not see fruit in an area. You may be sowing, and yet there's nothing on the vine. You may be wanting increase, but yet there's no ox in the stall. He said, you know what? Even if it, that, that's the case, I'm still going to rejoice in the Lord. I'm not going to rejoice in the Lord just when things are going good. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord regardless of whatever I find myself in. I love that song that Daniel wrote. I don't know all the lyrics, but, but it talks about praising God, and it talks about praising him, you know, when, when my fridge is full and when my fridge is empty. In other words, whether I have things loaded up or I have things loaded down, it doesn't make a difference to me. My satisfaction isn't in the steak in the freezer. It's in the steak inside of me that Jesus has placed that I can feed on. And he said, I will joy in the God of my salvation. It's easy, you got to get this, it's easy to rejoice when the answer comes. And I know when we're going through a difficult season, and you're going to hear an incredible testimony, it's not always easy to be rejoicing when you have a bad report. I'm not making little of that and saying that we're just supposed to be sadistic and just smiling all the time and everything's going to be great and, you know, we get a bad report and we're, ha, 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 you know, you know you're going to have days. But I'm telling you, the joy of the Lord, Nehemiah 8.10 says, shall be your strength. If you want strength coming out of those weak moments, you can't focus on the misery you're going through. You've got to focus on the God who is greater than what you're challenged with. And he said, the Lord God is my strength. And he will make my feet like deer's feet. And he will make me walk on my high hills to the chief musician with my stringed instruments. In other words, by the end of this, he was singing this song. He was singing out of his heart. He was rejoicing in God. He was happy even though nothing was happening good in his life. He was still rejoicing. Why? Because he discovered something. If I'm going to deal with adversity correctly, I can't deal with it from an emotional standpoint. I've got to deal with it from a God standpoint and realize that God is my strength. God is my hope. God is the one that I'm going to place my faith in. God is the one that I'm going to trust. And as long as I continue to do that, his joy will permeate my life and his joy will be my strength so that I can walk through some of the darkest days of my life. Some of you are walking through difficult days. Some of you watching are walking through difficult days in your life. And I want you to hear this testimony from Lara tonight as she comes and gets ready to share with us. I want this to encourage you because she walked through some dark days. And when you walk through some dark days, it's great to have a family and a church and people around you that can stand with you in the midst of it. You too can make it. You can overcome. You can walk in victory. You're not going under. You're going over. And I pray that this blesses you and encourages you in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome, Laura, as she comes. Possibly. Dear Lord Jesus, I come to you tonight, and I know you'll make me strong because of the times before. I can't seem to get rid of the fear that I may be too long-winded. Give your people peace, this precious church family, that they can leave at any time. And Lord, that the parts of your story will be emphasized as you want them to be revealed. We give you all the glory for this precious love story. Oh God, I ask you, please carry me through as this is the first time I've shared corporately 
but I've shared dozens of times. This is our story. May God, you get the glory. Thank you, Jesus. All right, so this is our love story. Here is the prayer that I was praying that I believe the Lord allowed and sent this struggle to our family. Lord, I had been praying, let us see your glory and know you in a supernatural way. The preparation began December of 2009. We received freedom from the chains of alcoholism, alcoholism and debt. We were beginning to be strengthened as a family. We were given a new name. Our old name stamps, which meant crusher, was changed by the Lord. He gave me a dream one night, and it was revealed the truth from my husband. We went to the courts and changed our name to Stan, Root New Beginning. Knowing this was the way, but not really understanding why, we felt the transformation. The Lord began over the next several years to use Praise the Lord on TBN at night. Through precious, precious servants like Mark Sharona and other worshipers like C.C. Winans, we praised the children and I. We worshiped. We, we made proclamations of supernatural healing in our minds, our bodies, and spirits, not yet knowing why we were doing these things. I was asking for freedom of unforgiveness, although I couldn't really identify any. He had me reading books on forgiveness. And these books were written by survivors of cancer, and I, I just wasn't grasping it. During this time, sweet Gracie received Jesus as we were watching Praise the Lord. We were being prepared. The bleeding began Saturday, September 28, 213. I was on a ladies' retreat in Gatlinburg, Tennessee. These precious people would later be used as his hands and feet for our family. The love of God walked out in a fleshly form as they served us as prayer warriors, pastor visits to the hospital, the home, and the children, tri-weekly meals delivered for 10 weeks. Once the need was announced, slots were filled within 48 hours. Rides to treatment, homeschool tutoring, all needs were met in an overwhelming way. A complete outpour of his spirit ensued. My first visitation, my time in his presence on December, on Sunday, November 30th, 2013. I had been receiving acupuncture treatments as just a desire to subside the bleeding. And, and it did help, but it never stopped it. But it gave me this peace that surpassed all of my understanding as I began to pass clots the size of a tumor. I could feel something was wrong, yet during this visitation from the Lord, I would close my eyes and open them over and over and focus on the light switch, saying, am I a sleeper? Is this real? I knew with every fiber of my being that it was real, and I would quickly clench my eyes closed so as not want it to end. I didn't want it to stop. In this vision, the kids and I with Randy, we were dancing and we were laughing we were experiencing pure joy and perfect peace, security and contentment that surpassed my knowledge this side of heaven so far. In this vision Jesus gave us, there was, we were on a beach and we were skipping. And the interesting thing was, it was a beach we had never been to, but I knew it was this side of heaven. There were cliffs and it was a different beach. It was not here. And as we felt his presence, he was just dancing with us. And he was telling us stories, and we were laughing, and we had no words. And then he would warm us by a fire and tell us stories, and we were captivated in his presence. I knew that this was going to be significant. 
I had now felt his presence in this first visitation. Sunday, December 1st, 2013 was the second visitation in preparing me. This is where I received the healing call to arms. By this point, I was wearing double pull-ups by this point to hold the flow of blood. The passing of the clots were now the size of a baseball. I was alone at home in need of a word of clarity. I was reading Joseph Prince's healing promises in the bathtub. And it was at that point that I remember reaching my arm out to the side, dropping the book, and looking up at the shower head. At that point, I was able to look upon the throne of God, but I could only see God from the knees down. And to his side, I looked over, and I saw Jesus. And he was just clothed in a beautiful robe. Oh, God, he was so bright. And I could tell that he was for me and that he was telling me to reach. And so I just started to reach in the bathtub, and I reached, and I arched my back, and I reached, and I beached, I beseeched him, and I begged him, please touch me. Am I not like the woman with the issue of the blood who leapt for your garment? Am I not worthy of your healing? Bless me, Lord, touch me. And I would just reach, and the, and the, the stronger I would reach, I, I couldn't touch him. And I'm, and I'm thinking, what does this mean? Why won't you let me touch you? And at that point, he just retracted his hand back, and he said, silently, fight. And I just began to weep. Fight what? Fight what? Fight what? At this point, I don't know what we're going to be fighting, but I can tell there's a fight coming. <laughs> the victory was already sealed in heaven. We just needed to surrender to his plan and fight with faith and works. It was that Sunday that I received my healing from cancer. From this forward, I'm going to tell it from this point forward, I'm going to tell you about the cleanup work. He took the cancer from me in advance, but we still had a tumor that was threatening my physical life. Monday, Tuesday, December 3rd, 2013, the, di the diagnosis and the re re revelation, excuse me, of our Goliath. A friend from church had referred us to a gynecologist. Since the birth of Max, who was now four, I hadn't been, I had him at home, and I hadn't been going to regular appointments. In the meantime, this is what had surfaced, surfaced to cause the bleeding, a cancerous tumor. There was a precious teddy bear man named Dr. Jameson that reassured Randy and I that I was probably suffering from fibroid cysts or endometriosis. As he performed the exam, he cocked his head sideways and he reassured us in his atmosphere but with words that could have shot fear through us, I'm so sorry, you have cancer. I wasn't stirred. From this point, point on, a supernatural presence came over me, and I was removed from my body. And he began, the Lord, to carry us through. Things happened very quickly. The first call we made was to our precious pastor in Ohio, Pastor Snook, and the church was activated in our fight. Prayers went out across continents. Other churches were joining us in prayer, and the call to arms would fight this battle with us. That afternoon, Tuesday, December 3rd, occurred the divine appointment of the general. Dr. Jameson had said, Meet me in my office, and I'll give you a treatment plan. At, th at that time, he let us know that a buddy of his owed him a favor, and he had one of the premier oncologists waiting for us, but we had to be there in the hour. We agreed, and the strong, intense, passionate doctor 
Pavelka was passionate about defeating the cancer. When we arrived, I told the general, as now I will so lovingly refer to him, that Jesus had already healed me and we just had some cleanup work to do. This was his first time meeting me and I must have sounded insane. The first prayer from the mouth of the general himself. At this point, I asked him, Dr. Pavelka, do you believe in God? He said he did. And so then I said, will you pray with me? And he said, sure I will. And I said, no, I mean now. Now, will you pray for me now? With me. My husband, myself, the nurse, and Dr. Pavelka joined hands and we prayed. All this time, clots of blood are gushing out on the floor. And he is praying. I don't even know what he prayed. The symbolism was that he prayed. And I asked him after that, Dr. Bavelka, do you believe in miracles? He said, I do. And I said, we're going to see a lot of them as we get to know each other better. I knew that I knew beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was using this in my life. I knew it, and I owned it. The plan of attack. This is my best chance of survival. At this point, I asked my sweetie to filter all of the emotional parts of this diagnosis so that I could focus on the victory, not the inevitable fight. I didn't want to know my percentages for survival. I didn't want to know how many women survive cancer. I didn't want to know all the details. I just wanted to focus on the Lord and him fighting my battle and our battle. Immediately, I was transported to admission via wheelchair once I had been packed with dozens of feet of gauze to block the bleeding. There was no time to go home and tell the kids. <laughs> Four blood transfusions were ordered over the next three days. I had lost 40% of my body's blood. It was already a miracle that I hadn't succumb to a stroke or a heart attack. We were due to have exploratory surgery to form a, formulate a plan. The tumor was larger than any of us expected at 8.5 centimeters, but was not stage four, praise Jesus, as we had believed. I had a, a tumor on my cervix, cervix and they had believed that it wrapped around onto my uterus, bowel, and bladder. But by the praise of God, it didn't infiltrate those organs. And we would come to watch him use the chemo and radiation, which at one point I was so vehemently against until he said, this is the way for you. He would use that to retract this tumor back into the cervix and ultimately remove it. I spent the next several days flat on my back, a piece that surpassed all of my understanding overcame me. Jesus comforted me, and I comforted others. Everyone looked at me, those of little faith, as though they didn't want to get too attached. 25 rounds of chemo, 25 radiation surgeries, Six implant radiation surgeries, radical hysterectomy. This was the plan. And I never understood that this was, all I knew was this was her best chance for survival. I didn't understand that people really make it through all of this, and I didn't understand that they took two and a half years of treatment and condensed it into 10 weeks because this was my greatest chance for survival. And they asked my husband, will he be strong enough? And my sweetie said, she will. So unbeknownst to me, we went for it. And I'm glad I didn't know the details. Thursday, to de December 5th, 2013, we're pressing forward. I'm transferred via ambulance 
to a suburban branch to receive the much needed chemo and radiation. I received my last blood tr transfusion and I was introduced to the peaceful one who I will call the peaceful one, Dr. Shahada, my radiation oncologist. Dr. Shahada seemed to offer peace in his presence. I know that he wasn't a believer, but he had a peace that comforted me and he was so precious. My body molds were made. My body was marked for the ensuing treatments. Monday morning, December 6, 2013, was my first radiation, and I was taught, find me in the agony. The agony was yet to become more and more physical. At this point, it was the torture of the atmosphere and the surroundings of the machines and the sounds they made. It was not an environment conducive to his presence and his Holy Spirit, except for those of us who had his presence inside of us. It permeated everything. My questions, why are the walls and doors eight inches thick? Why is the door sealed during my treatment with me on the inside? Why does the machine sound like a torturous, screeching Led Zeppelin tune? How could he possibly use this treatment time each day to put me in a meditatively peaceful release state each day as I pictured him in the Garden of Gethsemane? It was just like the meditative state I would be in at the acupuncture when I received my visitation. And every day, radiation came to be my sweetest time because I would lay there in peace, in physical bondage, and I would picture him in the garden, and I would ask him, can this cup pass from me? And I knew the answer was no, but I'm with you. And I would say to them and everyone, do they not see, Jesus? Do they not see that you have already healed me and we just have cleanup work to do? We proceeded. My hesitations, his intervention. There were two things holding me back at this point. One was, how are we going to pay for this? We didn't have insurance. We were, were self-employed. We had just catastrophic. And this was not supposed to be covered. And as my treatment were going to overlap from 2013 to 14, we knew it was going to be quite costly. I was concerned that this may cripple our business and us financially. I struggled with feelings of unworthiness for how expensive it was going to be. And Please, please, Jesus, there was one more restraint. After the first chemo treatment, which I hadn't had yet, a dose of steroids, which they place in the cocktail, sent me straight to the moon. I lost my peace, and I knew it was not the way for me. I knew I was supposed to feel him in this pain, and I didn't want it. And so I asked him, if this is your way, Lord, reveal yourself to me. On the way to one of the treatments, Randy let me know that through the financial counseling, they had led him to believe that it's possible we would be covered. And in the middle of the night, the Lord work, woke him, and he checked a clause that they had jarred his mind of in our insurance policy. By the grace of God, the treatment was covered. Not only did we have the 13000 for the first year, but the 13000 for 2014 in cash in the safe. He had been getting us out of debt, and we had the money saved up. On a call to the second chemo appointment, I received an unexpected call in the car on the way there. And I'm told, we've decided to take the radiation. I mean, I'm sorry, the steroids out of your treatment plan. I knew that this was still the way 
and we had to proceed. After that first chemotherapy on Sunday, December 15th, 2013, part of our mission, mine, was revealed. Jesus told me as clear as day to get my eyes off of myself and focus on others. The Spirit of the Lord said, I'll take care of you now. Tend to the needs of others. This seemed absolutely crazy to me. In my, in my depleted state, how in the world was I going to do that? I immediately asked my sweetie to get some Christmas ornaments from our pole barn that I remembered, and we could begin distributing with a message of hope and compassion. From this point on, I began in the days leading up to Christmas to deliver these ornaments, whether patients were asleep or awake, offer them a smile and a touch and let them know that I was going to receive my healing, this side of heaven or the other. Either way, I was going to win, and that was available for them too. Monday, December 16th, we pressed onward, continuing to praise him in the storm. So we continued reassuring others of his assurance that I did not have cancer, only cleanup work. We grew stronger in faith as my body got weaker. I became thinner and weaker and frail, and his presence became greater and carried me. I was outside of myself, not looking at odds or the supernatural. We were all being carried by him, all of us, supernaturally. Our business grew. Randy attended every appointment and never left my side. At times, he physically held me up and carried me as we lived in a quarantined environment away from others at home. This is through the winter, and I couldn't be afford, afford to be around germs. That was the only way they'd let me do this at home and not spend it in the hospital. I continued to grab every breathing medical personnel to pray over me and with me. Everyone, every transportation aid, everyone. Our relationship with God and others strengthened. Struggles continued to arise, and he defeated them all. Setbacks came, but they never prevailed. It is clear now that he was putting on our full armor and calling us to be warriors for God. God was, Max was saved by God at this time. He had been having dreams about the lake of fire, and he would slip into my room as I was resting. I never left that room for all those weeks, and he would jiggle my leg and say, Mommy, are you awake? Knowing I wasn't, and he would wake me. Two mornings in a row, he shared his dreams about the lake of fire, and on the third morning, he asked me, Mommy, how can I make sure I don't go to the lake of fire? At this point, we carry on as always, but I am being carried by Jesus. We all are. He's my only chance for survival, this side of heaven. He becomes our rock, our shield, our joy in the agony, our peace in the storm, our sustainer, our protector, our intercessor. When my only prayer is his name, the way maker, the chain breaker, our everything was faithful. Dr. Andalina steps in to do rounds and offer encouragement. At this point, I was in the hospital from, for some complications, and the, the visiting attend, uh, physician on the team was Dr. Andalina. He was not my doctor at this time. The chemo doctor I had was a hopeless, sad little man who thought that I was a goner the day he met me. When I would go to his office, he would have his fingers ready at the keyboard, keyboard ready, ready to prescribe any drug I wanted. I didn't want the drugs. I wanted to grow through this pain. So I leapt at the opportunity to meet his partner, and I asked him, Dr. Andalina, will you be my doctor? He said, yeah, we can do that. I said, what about Dr. Jones? Am I going to hurt his feelings? And he said, he's a big boy. He can handle it. Didn't look back there, and I, and I never, upon my appointments at the chemo office, had to face Dr. Jones. Thank you. God knew I would have just busted out crying, feeling really bad. Um, he wasn't who I needed. 
God wasn't using him in my life. Outside of the plan. This was that first implant radiation. I had bad feelings about them from the start. They were to insert this crazy metal cable rod into uh, my vagina and fill me with a ball of iodine, send me through a machine to radiate it. And this was to shrink the tumor. Remember, I already knew I was healed. So I didn't have a good feeling about these, but the general insisted that I hadn't had enough gauss through my body to survive. I must go. So I proceeded, and it almost took me out, put me back in the hospital for a long time, and I was really sick. Fast forward to the second radiation implant surgery. Remember, there were supposed to be six. I received a big miracle. I tried begging all of the doctors to scratch these surgeries. I had no peace about them, but was no longer strong enough to fight with words. On the eve before the second surgery, which was scheduled at dawn the next morning, I said my goodbyes in my heart to my loved ones. I prayed over each of them that night as they peacefully slept. I had already known with every fiber in me that I would not just receive healing in this cancer journey, but complete restoration. He promised I would. He told me that he would restore to us the years the swarming locust had eaten. Yet, in my doubt, I wondered about that first visitation. Was that beach on this side of heaven? Or would I receive my restored body on the other? I tightly hugged the kids and my sweetie as many times as possible that night. My sweetie wouldn't even advocate for me at this point, telling me to fight and not to quit. He said I needed to trust him based on what the doctors were saying and follow through with the surgery. I prayed with the kids at bedtime and assured them that God is always in control, that Jesus is still with us, and he would never lead us astray, that he would guide us and carry us through. No one grasped the severity of this impeding, sur impending surgery, no one but me and Jesus. The next morning, I held my dad tightly as I told him it would all be okay and cried and held each other. I thought I'd never see my daddy again this side of heaven as my sweetie practically carried me to the car in the middle of the night. We had to be there very early. I knew Jesus would use my sweetie, Mama, my dad, my sister, and the kids to carry each other through in the event that we would part ways later that morning. I knew he would restore, restore me, them, dry their tears, and continue to carry them faithfully through. I still had his presence that surpassed every ounce of my understanding at this point. I told Jesus, I'm planning to meet you in a little while, unless this isn't your plan, and you're going to need to do something. As we turned off of our street, Lord, I Need You by Matt Marr was on the radio. My body and circumstances were eclipsed by his overwhelming peace and comfort and assurance that this was indeed still his way. I asked him to do something, to fight for me, to intervene in this surgery if it was not his will. I knew that this was all a part of his perfect plan, though. Upon arriving at the hospital, I was immediately prepared for surgery. I had that peace and knew that he was in control. I still let everyone know that this surgery was not for me and that it didn't feel like part of his plan. As the tears peacefully streamed down my face with no elevated breathing or movement in my body whatsoever, I continued to, to insist that I had already been healed. I was grateful for every person, event, and revelation he had offered to challenge and transform our family up to this point. My sodium levels remained dangerously low from those steroids. 
My adrenal glands were exhausted. The levels were even too low for surgery, yet the doctors, nurses, and anesthesiologists proceeded. One of the meds caused me to lose my sight during this preparation period. So now I'm heading into this surgery, truly walking by faith, not by sight. As the anesthesiologist kicked the foot brake on my bed to escort me down to the OR, I maintained my peace and hope that God might still do something. As the foot of the bed protruded into the hallway, the house phone rang. In the hospital room, I could sense at the instant of this call, it had a different ring to it. I could feel it in my soul. Everyone was shocked that this phone rang. They all had cell phones on their sides. And this call got all of our attention. On the other end of the line, the OR called and the surgery was scrapped along with all future radiation surgeries. I raised my hands toward heaven and thanked Jesus in front of everyone for stepping in, for intervening. I had not heard him wrong in that first visitation. That beach, that joy, that presence, that laughter and security was to be available this side of heaven, and we would press on toward the hysterectomy surgery, our final part of the liberation from the tumor. On the way home from surgery, I asked my sweetie to drive me back to the hospital. I felt way too sick to go home. I told my sweetie that I thought I needed to be near a crash cart and not around the kids, who may be tempted to worry at this point. Randy seemed very angry at me. He shouted that this was not me, that I was not a quitter, and that I was supposed to fight. I comforted and assured my husband that I was fighting, that my spirit and mind were stronger than ever, but that my body was nearly dead at this point. My sweetie reluctantly drove me back to the ER, and my only path of admittance was through the germ-infested ER. We were only there an hour or so before the attending had denied my admission. He told my sweetie that I was too sick to be there. He explained that in the surrounding rooms were cases of meningitis, pneumonia, and the flu, any of which could claim my life at this moment. He told us to go home, rest, be in the atmosphere of our home, that doctor assured us that 911 was only a phone call away. He also confirmed to Randy that my body was dying. Chemotherapy is designed to kill every cell in your body, not just the cancer cells. I have come to the belief that if you can survive it, you will be restored. The journey until hysterectomy, that was my story at least. The journey until hysterectomy provided reprieve, rest, and preparation. Over the ne next month, our holistic physician, Dr. Pittman, would be used in a great way to remove a good enough portion of the collateral damage the treatment had caused so that I could have that final surgery. He told me that Jesus had to be carrying me through. Dr. Pittman comforted me and prayed Bible verses over me. He told me that he felt like this was Romans 12.1 and that I was presenting myself as a living sacrifice that the kids were learning from this struggle. He knew our family was being transformed in a supernatural way, that the ripple effects of this journey were sending a sweet aroma to heaven. I felt so blessed. I felt so used. I felt whole. On February 26, 2014, I call this Tumor Liber Liberation Day. On this day, I was full of life and hope, in large part due to the life-breathing, faith-filled biblical strength offered freely by Dr. Pittman. I had received some visits from church friends in my strong yet frail state. I maintained my weight 
and even celebrated the 5th and 14th birthdays of Max and Chloe at Winter Jam in a private box, thanks to the provision that God provided from my sweetie. Refuge from the germs in flu season. We were living out our faith and being blessed in a supernatural way. I had placed a call during this time to Dr. Annalena, my encourager, the chemo doctor, concerning the upcoming surgery. I felt a press to consult with this man just one last time, someone. I reminded him again that I did not have cancer and that all of this was cleanup work. I held strong to that promise. I assured Dr. Andalina that I knew having this surgery wasn't necessary to heal me, but that I knew it was God's way. Dr. Andalina agreed that it probably wasn't necessary, and he counseled me through that call and said I was probably right, but I might as well proceed. As all of the female parts were fried and toxic at this point. I thank Jesus for the confirmation from Dr. Andalina, and we press forward. On the day of the surgery, I rejoiced for the hope and strength Jesus had faithfully supplied as I was wheeled down the hall towards surgery. I later found out in, in recovery that with both surgeons and their teams present in the OR, the general bowed his head and led the teams in prayer. Praise Jesus. There were two teams because the size of the tumor had caused two kiwi-sized hernias to protrude from the intestinal, intestinal lining around my pubic bone. So, I mean, this was just against all odds. After both surgeries, I emerged six hours later in a hospital room, and we continued to witness miracles that release me from doctor ordered morphine pumps and pain meds that I knew weren't for me in order to allow Jesus and Jesus alone to touch me through the pain. By his power, a proposed five to six day stay was condensed to two supernatural days and we were home again to be reunited with the kids. Tuesday, March 4th, no cancer. Just five days later at my post-op, we were able to witness God's glory, this sight of heaven, at a whole new level. Supernatural proof of his perfect plan was received at the revelation of the written pathology report. This was all I really cared about at this visit. I needed to hear the results. Once again, Jesus delivered. I asked the general if the report showed that I had cancer. He reluctantly, and I mean with hesitant wonder, read the interesting results of the report, which had reported that I didn't have cancer. I said, Dr. Pavelka, general, do you mean right now, after you have removed my body parts or before the surgery? Before the surgery. The cancer was gone. He was peacefully stumped in his amazement. He gave me that promise and we held on to the end and I just wanted everyone to know that I wasn't a crazy woman but that he healed me in advance. All we were doing was walking it out and allowing him to release us. And in the process, he strengthened our family. And we have never been the same. We are so thankful. Proceeding from here, our family continues to this day in our press to be good and faithful servants of our creator. The healing has continued to the entire three year, 3.5 year 
three to five year recovery process and continues to this day. He has taken us places in our faith where our feet have failed. All the while, he has been our God through all of it. In the agony, in the valley of the shadow of death, in the lamenting tears, through life-sucking words of many doubters, along the way, he chose to reveal just a bit of his glory to us as we had asked and allow us to know him in a supernatural way as requested. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. That's powerful. Amen. What a powerful, powerful testimony of God's grace. He never leaves you nor forsakes you, church. Why don't we stand to our feet? There's nothing I need to add to that. That was so powerful. And maybe you're watching my live stream or maybe you're here today and maybe you're walking through a difficult season. Sometimes when you're at the end of your rope, Jesus is still the hope at the end of your rope. And every promise that he makes to you, he will deliver on that promise. Even though we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, we fear no evil. For his word and his spirit is here to comfort us. Maybe you're in a place here today or you're watching by live stream and you're going through a difficult season. I pray today, just as Lara shared, that she stayed faithful through faith and patience. She inherited the promises. No, it may not have happened the way that she thought, but in the end, the only thing that she was looking for was a cancer-free diagnosis. And she obtained that promise by faith. Maybe you're in the midst of your trial right now. Maybe you're in the midst of an incredible battle. Don't quit. Don't throw in the towel. Keep on fighting the good fight of faith. Lay hold unto eternal life. Father, we pray for those that may be watching or here today that are in the midst of the struggle, that you would strengthen them with all might on the inner man, that they would know what the hope of their calling is, Father, and that you would continually guide them and direct them and lead them, Father, through whatever process that they need in order to get to the desired results. We thank you for healing that's coming to people's bodies right now that needs deliverance, that they would lay hold to the promise of healing right now, whatever they're going through. And most of all, we pray for salvation. Maybe you're watching today and you heard that powerful testimony or you're watching a rebroadcast and you say, my God, I need Jesus to be with me. If you want Jesus Christ in your life, all you have to do is ask. All that call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. He turns no one away. So just pray this after me if you desire him to come into your life and you'll never be the same from that moment forward. Just say, Jesus, I believe you're the son of God that you came to earth to die for me. Come into my life and save me. I turn my back on yesterday to start this journey with you. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. If you just prayed that prayer for the first time, you invited Jesus into your life, please go to our website, thefaithcenter.com. I have a little booklet that I want to send you absolutely free to get you started right in the family of God. Just go on our information page and send us your name, your address, and we'll mail that directly to you as you shoot us an email right through our website. Find a good local church in your area if you're watching from out of town. And if you're in the Fort Myers area, join us at one of our exciting services here, right here in Fort Myers. God